for me, it all started with uh, a friend from school, Guido Holzmann. Uh, he was just learning bass. I was already playing a little drums. I played in a in a band from the music school. I was in the I was learning drums at this point. Other guys were learning guitar, bass, vocals, or something. And once a week there was this band from this music school, and uh, yeah, we did some songs together. I only remember "Under My Thumb" from the Rolling Stones, which was pretty cool to play for me as a young kid. And then I. I was already into metal, there was already the extreme scene, more extreme uh, for these days, going on with the first album from Celtic Frost, Sodom and all that. I was pretty uh, infected by that, uh, to play as fast and uh, heavy as possible. So yeah, we, we wanted to do something like that and we found a guitar player, I can't remember, I think it was in a local bar. Yeah, in Germany this was possible, I was drinking, we can drink beer when we are 16 at a bar, and so we did, I, even, I think I was even 15 or younger, uh, but there was, the rules are not that, as hard as in the USA. And uh, yeah, we found this older guy who just also learned guitar, he was absolutely not good, he later went on playing drums. Uh, and he even played uh, on two albums or three albums uh, in a grindcore band called Nyctophobic. Uh, yeah, but with this guy we started a band called Reptile and, and uh, uh, the singer was Markus Beringer, who was also the singer later in Sudden Darkness. And yeah, we, <laughs> we basically just made one song <laughs> and brought this out as a demo and this was recorded in a basement uh, with a with a double cassette desk deck, you know, first playing the music and then when you record it to the next cassette, <laughs> uh, you add vocals with a microphone to that. We, I did that later also with a fun band called Hasenfurz, <laughs> we did that same. Of course it sounded like shit and uh, we also did a video clip which I haven't seen until these days in a garage uh, for this one song. Uh, Reptile was the name of the band and I have some minutes of music for you now, it's really horrible. <laughs> Yeah, this was Reptile. Okay, this was more than bad, <laughs> but very extreme for those days, and I think this must have been 85 or 86 or something like that. Uh, yeah, and I, I can't remember how Guido and me got into Sudden Darkness, which was a hard rock band at that point. Uh, I don't know why, but I don't care. We went there and yeah, sooner or later we were a part of this local hard rock band, Sun Darkness. And there was already the guitar player, uh, Volker Faust, in that, who already talked about stuff like Slayer or Anthrax. Even we still played that hard rock, new wave of British heavy metal style stuff, which was already a little outdated at that point, I would say. And uh, with singer Markus Beringer, who was not a real singer back then, it was more shouting and, uh, yeah, a guy who wants to sing, <laughs> let's say it that way. Uh, we tried to bring in this heavy stuff into Sun Darkness, which was a challenge because the second guitar player, a guy called Yaroslav was his name, he was not able to do this fast, uh, thing here on the guitar, uh, which was, Volker was really good in that, he already did ding 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 and stuff, you know, I don't know the English word for that, but he was really good in that, he, he always loved bands where you can hear this, this uh, attack on the 
guitar. Yeah, and he was really bad in that. So there was this, we went to record our very first demo tape, which was in a in Ludwigshafen, Germany, in a, in a youth house for young people. And there was this free studio in there, there was a guy who was operating it, he must have been back then 70 at least. Uh, he had these microphones and this, I think it was an 8-track machine, but only to record live there, but you were able to mix at least like in a live situation and stuff. And so in one day we did this Lord Nightmare demo tape, which uh, already had at least one fast song on it called Living in Sin, which uh, the song was mid-tempo, but there were parts of it. Uh, where I personally played double bass for the very first time. I remember I just got that for a twin pedal thing for Christmas from my parents, so I had not really a clue how to play it. I just had an idea how to play it, and goddamn, you can hear it on these recordings. Oh, yeah, I have something for you here now. Just listen to it. Sin, not at the Holiday Inn like Gene Simmons was singing, <laughs> but yeah, this was maybe the first uh, real, um, yeah, Some Darkness song, I would say, because uh, it was way heavier than the other stuff, especially what the guys did before we three joined that band. Uh, yeah, so I remember we did a TV appearance in my TV show and we played Living in Sin and went totally wrong and all the other songs it was the second guitar player who just couldn't keep track with us <laughs> doing this more heavy metal thing here uh, and uh, I don't know if there's any footage mm, let's see Oh yeah! 
Yeah, but uh, whatever, this guy quit or we fired him, I can't remember well. And Some Darkness then basically was Folger, Guido, Markus and me. And uh, we didn't have a second guitar player anymore. And yeah, we took over the thing and started playing heavier stuff. Uh, and uh, one of those songs... Uh, was uh, Satanic Butcher. I think the lyrics were still written by Markus, who left the band then, after we had our first show with Sun Darkness, which still was with Yaroslav, uh, or Yaro. Uh, this was a pretty successful show, basically, because we were kind of new to the audience, and there were at least three, four hundred people. There's a video of that, uh, where you can see a little bit of that. Yeah, and this was this famous show where singer Markus broke his leg during the first or second song, or his knee, more or less. He broke his knee when he did some weird stage diving or something. And yeah, the ambulance was already waiting outside. He wanted to finish the show. He did, unbelievable, while sitting. Uh, must be a horrible pain, but uh, he did it. And But he was really long in the hospital and we... I think it was this was the cause why he was not in the band anymore. We just went on. I remember that I was the lead singer at the drums for a while. Not on purpose, but we, we didn't find a singer. Uh, yeah, but I can't, don't know if it's before a guy called Tom or after that. Uh, with this guy called Tom, at least, we did that Satanic Butcher demo. I don't think it was named Satanic Butcher, but at least the song was on it. Also, No Tears and a new version of Lord Nightmare. So it still was a mix of the hard rock, new wave of British heavy metal sounding, sun darkness and the new stuff. And uh, Satanic Butcher, a very primitive song, except of that it was fast in two parts, really fast, uh, became a local hit uh, on, on a tape. Uh, we sold tapes in our area as shit and be just because of this song. When I go to Frankenthal, to my hometown where we, where, where we all lived back then, Still people tell me, oh, Satanic Butcher, it's unbelievable, and this uh, over 30 years later. So, uh, yeah, this was freaking me out. <laughs> Yeah. 
But uh, this primitive stuff was not enough for us. Even we just had parties in our rehearsal room and it was a lot of alcohol. The guys from crematory were there all the time. Their singer was cooking for us while we were drinking. I remember a burning car in front of the rehearsal room. It was a fucking wild time back then, for sure. Uh, yeah, we were friends with most of the other bands uh, where we were rehearsing, which was in Mannheim near where this famous Sevener Club is now, only 10 minutes from that, but the building is no more, it's uh, broken down. And uh, yeah, we still our music got a little more structured and a little more, don't get me wrong here, but progressive <laughs> with more parts in the song. And this led to this uh, Fear of Reality video, uh, demo tape and video, I'm not too wrong here, <laughs> uh, which was a step forward uh, from what we did before. Also recorded in a in a in a house for young people where I don't know the name for that in English. Uh, with I think also 16 tracks here, but uh, of course not top notch. But still, this demo tape was uh, not sounding too bad, and we can listen to it a little bit now. Yeah, and this is a video clip that we did with uh, the camera equipment that I was able to get uh, when I had my TV show back in the 80s. So I was able to borrow camera equipment. So and we were able to the place uh, to go to this place where we can edit videos with two big machines and two monitors and really basic work. But yeah, we had a video clip and. As I had a TV show, I was able to broadcast it, and this I think this made us a little famous in our area. And along with maybe Visit Visera, later Saitra, I would say for a while we were the top metal band in at least this area. So uh, yeah, still it was a local act with only cassettes, but I was proud on those demo tapes. Uh, it was still a release that people can buy and uh, I always was longing for 
an album, of course, and I, I, I think I sent it to all the record companies back then, Noise, Steam Hammer, even Earthshaker, to Gamma, Whoop and Gamma were the ones who replied. They invited us to Kirchheim Tech, this is where they were based near Stuttgart or at least in the area of Stuttgart and we drove there and they, to this weird house that looks like a whore house <laughs> and I think it was at one point or at least one of the floors was still a whore house it looked weird and uh, yeah we met uh, Mr. Garatoni and Mr. Marek they told us that they like our demo tape uh, they are not happy with the way we look we all had short hair. I think Guido had long hair, but he just cut them off because I don't know why he did that. Uh, I had this uh, hair like a little bit like early Rod Stewart, he, you know, this uh, hedgehog <laughs> thing here and long here. We call it Foco Wheeler in <laughs> Germany, which means vorne kurz, hinten lang. Uh, yeah, and he told us, oh, you look like teenagers, maybe, yeah, we were, except of our guitar player folder. Uh, you need to change something here. But uh, this was uh, not that, this was not a problem for them, and they already gave us the contract. We, they, one hour later, we had the contracts in our hand, and we thought, yeah, got them, Gamma Records, Tokyo Blade, Darkness, Necronomicon, Vectom. Stormwitch, Gravestone, all these bands were on there. Uh, I was I was a total fan of Vampire, who also played in my TV show. So they had a lot of good stuff that I liked, and uh, some of the pro sounds, the productions, were even better than on the stuff from Steamhammer and Noise. Uh, but of course, there never was as much promotion and. Uh, they didn't do as much as the other labels do for their bands, but hey, we have a red record deal, we were able to record an album. And this is all that I wanted back then. So I remember that we returned that contract to Gamma. I don't know if we drove there again. I, I can't. I don't know. I think we drove there again because there was uh, hello this uh, point where I had uh, where, where they gave me albums from SDI and where I was able to grab some stuff at Gamma. And I remember getting my first CD back then. I, this was still something new, at least here in Germany. We talk about 1987, so I couldn't even play it. But yeah, this was my first CD. I think it was SDI. Uh, I don't know the, the one with the with the razor blade scratching on the arm and stuff like that. This was my first CD. Yeah, we got it was all we were there a second time, and we got booked uh, to a studio in Stuttgart called Zuckerfabrik, which was kind of famous because all the later Gamma bands uh, recorded there. First it was their own studio, Spiegel or Spiegel Studios. It comes from the band Eulenspiegel, which was a medieval music uh, band from the 70s and one of the guys played in that band. I think it was Garatoni playing drums in that band. So they called it Spiegel Studios from Eulenspiegel. And, uh, but we recorded at Zuckerfabrik in Stuttgart and uh, even the second Exuma album sounded like hell. There was some good stuff coming from that studio. And yeah, and we, we just drove there. <laughs> uh, I didn't have to bring a drum set. There was a huge Sonor drum set. I think Sonor Signature was the name of that. With, I think, 
five or four toms in the, in the front and uh, at least two floor toms. It was all huge. Uh, I'm only one, I don't know in English, but one meter seventy-five. And still, this was this is a pretty regular size, <laughs> but uh, I had a problem with that huge thing because the toms were as long, so they were much higher than I, I was used to. I never was playing like that, like Lars Ulrich. I always played more, um, yeah, the, yeah, I think you know what I mean. So I really had problems with that drum set, also with the rim shots on the snare, because the rim on the Sonor stuff was, or still is, I don't know, higher than on, on other brands. So if you're used to play rim shots, you don't think about where you place the stick, you just do it. And in this case, it was really hard because it didn't work out at all. So I played the snare just like a regular uh, drum. not with a rim shot. This is why the snare sound is not as cool as the rest of the drum set. I think I really like the toms and the bass drum really great in that studio. Yeah, and we recorded uh, guitars and drums live. So it was Volker and me, I was counting in and then let's go. There was no click track or something. <laughs> you actually can hear that really drastic in the song Devil Dope and because this song uh, ends with the same part as it starts, <laughs> it's way faster in the end. Uh, this is where you actually really can see no click track at all. I don't know what happened next because uh, I was only there for four days or so and the whole recording time was seven or eight days. Uh, I think next was the second guitar or because this first guitar wasn't never deleted, it was just kept. Then the bass came in later, that was weird, and uh, yeah, solo guitar and vocals, that's it. Um, not, not No choirs or something, there was not much stuff going on. I remember that uh, we were able to sleep in that studio, there was a little kitchen downstairs and there was a studio level and next on more the roof there was a way you can sleep, it was really horrible but it was okay. There were all these master tapes, Storm Witch and all that stuff, SDI and whatever. And I was drunk as fuck because I, uh, my granddaddy was still alive at that point and uh, he made this whole, he, this homemade uh, fruit wines, uh, strawberry, cherry. And if you drink it, it just tastes good, but you don't realize that there's a ton of alcohol in that. So two nights in a row I was drunk as fuck and I remember puking <laughs> that I needed to puke and I didn't make it to the basement where the restrooms are and the kitchen is where it was. Uh, so I puked completely in a bunch of master tapes and I never knew that it was Stormwitch, it was one of that. Another one I think was SDI and it was really a mess what's going on. Uh, I think he, the, the, the owner of the studio didn't notice that. He was pissed off because of other things, because they were destroying glasses or something like that. He really was pissed and was calling the record company that we party too hard and that he is very close to uh, get us out of the studio and not finish the album and stuff like that. I don't think it was because of my puking, there was other bullshit going on. Uh, like we were back, back, back in those days, we felt like rock stars doing an album. Uh, yeah, yeah. When the album was finished, I think uh, we had to return. Our guitar player already had a job. Uh, I think others were still in school. Oh, I'm sorry, I totally forgot that we got a new singer for that album. His name is was Alki. Uh, his real name was Udo, but uh, Alki from drinking alcohol. He was more or less a punk, I would say. Not a real metalhead. You can also hear that a little on the album. Uh, I met him at school and he was interested and yeah, he became the singer of Sudden Darkness and pretty close, I think, to the recordings even. And we had a second guitar player who never appeared on that album and never was in the band after that album, but he was there. This was a guy called Lotte who later became yeah, quite famous as the songwriter and guitar player in the early days of uh, 
or the first years of crematory. Yeah. So, yeah, so we made that album and we needed to return, we needed to go home again and so we called this owner, uh, I can't remember his name right now, uh, please do the mix by your own and yeah, that's it, yeah. So we did and uh, well, after some weeks I got a, a parcel with, I think, one test pressing and it fucking sounded like shit. I don't know what he did, so I, we, I called Gamma and told them that we don't accept the album the way it is. surprised that they agreed on okay we give you two or three more days for a mix and there then we returned to the studio some weeks later and uh, finally we were happy with the sound uh, at least what we heard in the studio I remember even that Volker and me drove to Frankfurt where we where this album was cut, you know what I mean, with this, this company who made the mother of the album. So I'm really happy that I was a witness to that back in the days. So it still was 87 here, uh, because you won't see that anymore. Maybe now again, as vinyl is uh, getting stronger, but uh, yeah. And uh, this next thing was that there was going on nothing at all. Then I called Gamma several times and I asked, hey, when is our album out? Uh, and they always said, ah, two weeks, two weeks. That's what I called friends and fans of the band. Yeah, two weeks, in two weeks. And this goes, went on for months. It was already 1988. When I think they were a little, yeah, they thought, okay, let's send them test pressings. So they calmed down a little or something, yeah, and I got 12 test pressings of that final and second mix. Uh, yeah, and I thought, okay, this is a good sign. But in the meantime, this was one of the last things Gamma ever did. So I, I don't know if they went bankrupt or if they just stopped operating. I don't know, because later on they did some uh, meditation music and stuff. So they were still kind of in business, but yeah, but that's it. This album never was released. And this was really hard for personally for me because I mean I knew that it won't be a success like Maiden Metallica, Judas Priest or something like that. But I wanted to goddamn have an album out with my photo on it and my name on it. I mean I was uh, 17, and I mean this was my dream. It's more easy these days, but back then this was. You were the hero <laughs> when you have a record deal and your album out. So all we got was this here. This is really one of the uh, test pressings in a good shape that I still have. And uh, I mean, it's not completely mint, I would say. But uh, yeah, that's the best you can get. Uh, I sold one for a, a thousand euros, which was in a really bad shape. I, I let the buyer knew that before. Uh, he didn't care. He just wanted to have it. At this point, I didn't know that I had this. I found this uh, by mistake. I thought uh, I wouldn't have a good copy, but this is a really okay copy, I would say, of the unreleased album. And I think, yeah, we should give it a listen now from the original test pressing.
yeah, of course we were disappointed, and this broke the band. I mean, I never considered stop something to play music or something, but in 1989 we went on with Sun Darkness, and we noticed that it won't go on like this. Uh, first, we got rid of Alki because we wanted to do more music, not this thrash metal that we did with uh, on the in the days when we recorded that album. Uh, we were huge fans of all the recent thrash bands, uh, especially Folger was totally into S.O.D. and Anthrax with, with a strong guitar work. But uh, Guido and me, we already felt a little more artsy, <laughs> let's say it that way, uh, which didn't go well with Algi and Folger. So yeah, we, we gave it a day, but we went on a Sun Darkness with a new singer called Axel. Axel Schott. He was, as far as I know, only in a cover band called Emotion or something, which was locally playing very often. He was huge, or is a huge Thin Lizzy fan, Black Sabbath, Ossi, all that stuff. And I've me here. And I've me here. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the guys. The night that lasts a thousand years. <laughs> He was slightly older than us too, and yeah, it was really cool to work with this guy. And Roger, Roger or Roger, you would say Roger in America, but his name really is Roger. Roger Dequi. Uh, I don't know how we met him. I think he just was hired as the second guitar player, and he was in the band. Oh, I remember. He was with his own band in another rehearsal room where we were rehearsing. That's it, yeah. And then we we came together through that connection, I remember. And he was in the band with Volker for a while as the second guitar player. And when Volker was gone, yeah, Roger, Roger took over and he was all the more, way more artsy and more into bringing something special into the music than Volker or Alki did. <laughs> Lineup and we did another Sun Darkness demo tape uh, with some really interesting songs. Uh, but technically, this was already Economist, but it was still a Sun Darkness demo tape. So, this was the last thing uh, we did. this new band uh, we didn't do satanic butcher or stuff like that anymore so we re 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 we we renamed 
to weird enough economist which uh, is a, uh, a business newspaper from Great Britain way from right uh, just because I had a stash of uh, stickers from this uh, newspaper and it only said economist without any other commercials on that so I thought okay we already have stickers why don't we call ourselves economists and we were so open for everything in these days you know everything was a cool idea and this was a cool idea and the first thing we did was this demo tape here uh, psycho rotten creatures that's how we called it <laughs> how we called ourselves <laughs> yeah this was the first demo and uh, I think it was with the help from uh, Markus from Crematory and, and a local guy here who was totally in the demo business here well, Andy Siri, he's working now for Nuclear Blast they helped us getting a contract with uh, Massacre Records uh, after we did this full album as a self-produced thing I think we only did 250 copies or so uh, the New Build Ghetto Status album, which I'm, to be honest, I'm still proud of that. It w never sold too much. I think uh, we, I saw an old uh, statement from Massacre saying we sold 1700 copies or something like that. Okay, these days this would be fine, but back then this was not really good. I think the music was. Yeah, it was always. It was not easy to consume here and there. We just. We were already influenced by bands like, uh, yeah, a little bit Voivod here, and uh, what is the name? Ah, yeah, An Anna Cruzis. We were all big fans of Anna Cruzis. I already was a Vanilla Road fan since The Deluge came out in 86, but you didn't hear it really well on the old Sudden Darkness stuff. But yeah, here and there, there was already some drum parts that I had stolen. <laughs> Yeah, and we felt we felt this 90s freedom to do whatever you want, uh, but still it was metal all through. But it was, uh, yeah, this uh, yeah, it's hard to describe the feeling of the early 80s, uh, 90s. Uh, it was yeah, kind of freedom, which is, uh, which is good and bad because we had some really horrible music in the 90s but also really some interesting and innovative good music in the 90s. I would say this is one of the better ones here even it was not a huge huge success. We After that we went on tour with Donor, the Aust Austrian band Mayfair and I think another band, I don't know the other band who was on board for a week or so Ach Schweizer, it was the band, it was a German, way before Rammstein, German uh, singing band. Uh, a band singing in German, sorry. Uh, yeah, but basically that's it. Then we did a second album, but this cover is only an idea. Uh, or it, maybe it would have been the cover, but as you can see it here, it is just a... Uh, 